This video is sponsored by the Arcos Institute of Geosciences. Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at a video that was put out by the Impact 360 Institute answering the question, is the Bible reliable? Personally, my answer to that question depends on what you mean by reliable. Do you mean accurately records historical events? Then it's of varying reliability depending on which book we're talking about, but generally speaking, it's kind of bad. Do you mean accurately records the beliefs and practices of an ancient culture showing how they evolved over time? Well then, it's actually quite reliable. Do you mean the manuscript tradition stayed faithful to the original texts? Well then, it's hard to tell, but we have no real reason to believe that there were major changes to most of the texts, although we do know of several major changes that were made at some point, so we know it's not perfectly reliable. Anyway, let's see if they actually explain what they mean by reliable and how they answer the question. But first, a word from our sponsor, AIG. Bet you didn't see that one coming. Don't worry, it's not what you think. The Arcos Institute of Geosciences, or the good AIG as I refer to them, is an online school meant to help people understand geologic concepts. AIG is useful for anyone with a general interest in geology, looking for supplemental material related to geology, or is trying to advance their education and professional development. You can take the introductory class for free at aig.vicerhino.com or by following the link in the description. The school is run by geology professionals, with most courses presented by Stephen Bauman, a professional geologist in the United States and a friend of the channel who has helped me make sure that I am accurate when talking about geology. Bullshit, 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 and more bullshit! Courses offered are geologic topics that aren't easily found online and include tricks of the trade and things you can only learn from practical experience. Costs range from free to a relatively small cost to fit any budget, with most courses being under $20. The subject matter varies greatly, and there should be something for everyone. All courses consist of video modules with quizzes at the end. Additional materials, when required, are also included in the lesson with your purchases. Samples of classes include geologic symbols and abbreviations, basics of stress and strain failure, and North American stratigraphic code. New courses are uploaded one to four times per month, with most taught in a classroom type setting. Some include field videos, so you can understand how the knowledge is applied in a practical sense, and if you're serious about understanding the science of geology, AIG can help you reach that goal. Be sure to check out the links in the description to sign up! Is the Bible reliable? You know, one of the great things about Christianity in general is that you can investigate it with eyes wide open. This isn't some magical book. It's not Aladdin's lamp. It's not something only for the special initiated group. Well, that depends on who you ask. One of the things I've found out from being a content creator who focuses on religion is that there are groups of Christians who, when you point out God's immoral behavior in the Bible, or contradictions, or problems, will respond with the claim that only someone who is filled with the Holy Spirit is capable of correctly interpreting scripture. Of course, this comes across as a thought-stopping technique where they don't need to actually have an answer for a difficult question about what they find in the Bible. They just know that the atheist is incapable of correctly interpreting scripture at any point purely by virtue of the fact that they are an atheist. Hell, one of the websites that I frequently use when I want to look at the original Greek or Hebrew words used in the Bible, blueletterbible.com, has a whole article on how only Christians can properly interpret scripture. They even go to the trouble of misquoting the Bible to support their interpretation. Bit of a weird choice for a website whose whole thing is telling you which words were actually used in the Bible. But they say that in the New Living Translation, 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, But people who aren't Christians can't understand these truths from God's Spirit. What that verse actually says in that translation is, But people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's Spirit. And then when I look that verse up specifically on their tool that tells us what Greek words were used, they confirm that the word is never translated as Christian anywhere in the Bible, including the verse that they misquoted. Which is kind of beside the point here, but I did find it interesting. What you find when you investigate the Bible, not only does it have some pretty amazing claims in it about who God is and how you can know this God, but what's awesome is you find it's actually historically reliable. And notice that these two things are completely separate categories of claims. Even if I grant the historical reliability of the Bible, that doesn't mean that his claims about God are true. 
Because the thing is, even with books that historians pretty much universally agree are reliable, they often contain supernatural elements, and these elements get discarded as hyperbole or mythologizing. And this is actually something that a lot of apologists will ignore about the study of history when they try to claim that the Bible is reliable. No book is just universally agreed to be 100% completely reliable. The claims all get evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis, and depending on the nature of the claim, the existence or non-existence of corroborating accounts, who is making the claim, and several other factors, some claims will be accepted as most likely historical, others will be more tentatively accepted, while still others will be partially or wholly discarded. But apologists like to act as though it's an all-or-nothing game, where a book is either reliable or not reliable, and that's the end of the story. It's also worth noting that in the case of the Bible, we can't just treat it as one single source. And this is actually something that you should watch out for with apologists. They will often sneakily try to switch back and forth between treating the books of the Bible as a singular source, or multiple sources, depending on what suits them at the time. Claims of Jesus' post-resurrection appearances? Obviously that claim has multiple attestation. It shows up in multiple books written by different people. But then give it a moment and we'll end up talking about how reliable the entire Bible is as a whole because we have a single credit card sized manuscript from the book of John that dates decently early. Like, no, even if the early manuscript from John could give us confidence in reliability, it would only be the reliability of the book of John itself, not the whole Bible. And even then, it would only give us confidence in the reliability of the transmission of the original text, not in how accurate that text was to the events that it supposedly depicted. Now there's lots of different ways you could talk on this and you could spend a lot of time investigating the powerful reasons why you can trust the Bible. Yeah. I have spent a lot of time investigating the reasons why one could trust the Bible, and I didn't actually find those reasons to be all that powerful. Considering that the book is supposed to have been given to us by an all-powerful God, and that it's supposed to be his perfect message, I actually found the reasons to be kind of pathetic, if I'm honest. I just want to give you two powerful reasons of why you can trust the Bible. The first is it's historically reliable in this sense, especially in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the book of Acts, it gets the people, the places, the names, the local situation, the customs, it gets all of those things right. Eh, to a point, I suppose. But there are some things that it gets really wrong, though. Like calling the Sea of Galilee a sea, for one. It's a relatively small freshwater lake with no direct outlet to the ocean, and it is pretty shallow, being only 43 meters deep at its deepest point. For comparison, the Sea of Marmara, which is a fairly small inland sea in Turkey, has an average depth of 494 meters, with its deepest point being 1.4 kilometers. The Sea of Marmara also has a surface area of 11,350 square kilometers, as opposed to the 166 square kilometers of the Sea of Galilee. And all of this is rather irrelevant. It could be said that this is just me applying modern definitions to ancient writings. Maybe they thought of lakes and seas differently than we do today. And that is a valid point. Except nobody referred to that body of water as a sea until the Christians started doing it. It was consistently called a lake by other ancient writers who were actually familiar with the area, such as Josephus. And among the Gospel authors, you can tell that Luke was actually more familiar with the area than Matthew, Mark, and John, because he goes out of his way to avoid using the word sea to describe it, and uses the name for it that the locals would have been familiar with, the Lake of Gennesaret, or Gensre. Google told me both. I don't know how to parse this out anymore. To quote R. Stephen Notley, the professor of New Testament and Christian Origins at Alliance University, a private Christian university, whether Luke corrects Mark and Matthew on these occasions, or draws his information from elsewhere, what is clear is that Luke presents a more informed picture of the physical nature of the lake. To paraphrase, the author of Luke knows the area better than the authors of Mark, Matthew, and John. And then there's things like saying that Jesus traveled from Tyre to the Sea of Galilee by going through Sidon and then through the midst of the Decapolis. This actually might not be Mark being geographically inept. It might be that he was just more concerned with matching Messianic prophecy than he was concerned with geography, and there is part of a prophecy in Isaiah 9-1 that could be interpreted as having the Messiah take a similar route. This is supported by the fact that Matthew, who always likes to make connections to what he saw as prophetic scriptures as obvious as possible, made explicit reference to that passage when Jesus began his ministry in Matthew chapter 4, although it isn't specifically connected to this story in Matthew. 
but Mark liked to be more subtle than Matthew did. He often made reference to prophetic writings without coming right out and saying that that's what he was doing. But the route still doesn't really make much sense. It's presented as though Jesus is traveling through the various places on his way to Galilee. Tyre to Sidon, then through the midst of the Decapolis to the Sea of Galilee. The apologetic explanation for this is that if we look at the topography of the region, there is a mountain between Tyre and Galilee, Mount Maron. So Jesus is taking the long way round in order to avoid the mountain. Amusingly, one website even tries to support this by getting walking directions from Google Maps from Tyre to Mount Maron, and it shows a route that goes roughly the same path that Jesus would have taken, if we ignore the fact that it says he went through the midst of the Decapolis and pretend that he just had to hit the northernmost extremity of the Decapolis in order to make this work. And yes, I can confirm that that is indeed how Google tells you to get there, but there are reasons for that that have nothing to do with the mountain. Political reasons. You see, there's a border that the UN placed there in the year 2000 that is referred to as the Blue Line. Crossing this border is a violation of international law. So if Google doesn't want to get in trouble for telling you how to violate international law, it has to tell you to go around the border, which would take you farther north and east than you would need to go before overshooting it to the south and then coming back up to it from the south. But if we instead get directions from Tyre to a location that is close to the border on the Lebanese side, it just takes you there in a straight line. If we then find a location that is close to the final destination on the last set of directions but on the Israeli side of the border, this time we can get directions from there straight to the Sea of Galilee. And what's more, this longer route is supposed to be avoiding the difficult terrain of climbing a mountain. But if we look at the elevation change for the long route, it's very up and down. You have to climb up 4,121 meters and down 4,333 meters over the course of the route. That is a lot of climbing for not much elevation change at the end. For the short route, the first part has you going up 1,240 meters and down 483 meters, while the second part has you going up 428 meters and down 1,312 meters. It seems like the short route is not only shorter, but has easier terrain. And for the record, the site that had the walking route going the long way round had the destination as Mount Marin for some reason. When calculating the elevation, I used the same endpoint for the long route as I did for the short route, so that way I didn't have them unfairly climbing up a mountain that they were trying to avoid at the end of the route. Oh, and remember how earlier I said that in order to get that route you have to ignore the part of the verse where it says they went through the midst of the Decapolis? Yeah, well, guess what happens when that verse gets translated into English? In most cases, the Greek word that means midst in that verse just gets ignored, and it renders it something along the lines of went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis, making it sound like that verse is just pointing out that the Sea of Galilee just happens to be in that general region. This is kinda reasonable, I mean the Sea of Galilee is on the western border of the northernmost area of the Decapolis, so while it might not be the best way to explain where it is, it's not technically incorrect. The problem is that if we don't ignore the word midst, it changes the meaning of the verse, saying that before Jesus went to the Sea of Galilee, he went through the midst of the Decapolis. This would imply that he went quite a bit further south than the Hippos region, as that's where most of the Decapolis is. So this would make his route a bit more of an arching spiral type of route, and it would make Mark's description of it sound wrong to people who were familiar with the local geography. And remember how I pointed out that Luke would correct the name of the Sea of Galilee to the Lake of Gennesaret? Yeah, well, it turns out Luke completely omits this particular journey from his account. So the gospel author, who was clearly most familiar with the local geography, but was also clearly working from Mark, decided to leave out the description of a journey in Mark that is generally agreed does not make geographical sense. So yeah, it looks like Mark didn't really know what he was talking about, geographically speaking. So no. I would not say that the Bible gets all of those things right. And I didn't even get into the problems that it has with getting the people and customs right. Like, there's no record outside the Bible of there being a custom where the Romans released a prisoner to the Jews every Passover. It gets the time frame wrong of when Quirinius was governor of Syria. It completely disagrees with other sources about the character and behavior of Pontius Pilate. And I could keep going. So imagine your hometown. There's things that you know about your hometown that you would only know if you grew up there, right? Well, that's the same about these writers of the first century in these biographies and accounts of Jesus and the earliest Christians. Yeah, they might have gotten the details right about the earliest Christians, but like, they literally were the earliest Christians. Well, almost. And a lot of those details 
didn't actually survive to modern Christianity despite being recorded by these works. Like Mark's tendency toward adoptionism, the idea that Jesus was not the son of God in the virgin birth sense, but rather that he was an ordinary man that got adopted as the son of God at his baptism. And yeah, we've already looked at the problems that the Gospels have with geography. I think it's safe to say that the authors of Mark, Matthew, and John do not show a degree of geographical knowledge that could only be acquired by being a local. So when it speaks of names, it gets the names right. Sure, but those are the only details of those people that it does get right. Like, the fact that Iron Man 2 not only mentions Elon Musk but shows him on camera does not give any credence to the events depicted in Iron Man 2. It's possible to get names right without actually being historically accurate. When it speaks of the places, those places actually exist. Well, yeah, usually it did get the names right, if we ignore that the Sea of Galilee is not actually a sea. But when we're talking about a route that doesn't make any geographical sense between places that are actually real, the fact that the places are actually real doesn't make the route make sense. Like, if I say that I went from Fort Erie to Waynefleet by way of St. Catharines, if you're not familiar with the geography of the Niagara Peninsula, that probably doesn't seem off to you, and when you look it up, all of those places actually do exist, so maybe I know what I'm talking about. But if you are familiar with the peninsula, you would probably wonder why I went through St. Catharines to get there instead of just going straight down Highway 3. Yeah, you could come up with a post hoc rationalization for why one would go to St. Catharines first on a trip that ends in Waynefleet, but to just present it as went from Fort Erie through St. Catharines on his way to Waynefleet? That makes it sound like St. Catharines was a pit stop on the way, no reason to go there other than it being in between the starting point and the end point of the trip. And as long as we're talking about geographical knowledge that would be more common among people who live locally than those who live far away, I will take this opportunity to point out that if you stop halfway between Waynefleet and Dunville and then turn south, you will find yourself in Lowbanks. There is a road in Lowbanks called Dickout Road. You're welcome. When it speaks of the governmental leaders, those people actually were ruling during that time. Well, except for Quirinius, who was governor of Syria starting in 6 CE. The Bible says that he was governor at the same time as Herod the Great was king of Judea, but Herod the Great died in 4 BCE. So, yeah, I got the names right, but the details are completely wrong. Also, the author of Luke wanted people to think of the census of Quirinius in 6 CE as being the census that got Mary and Joseph into Bethlehem, but he described it as being an empire-wide census that required people to travel to the cities of their distant ancestors in order to get registered. This fails on two accounts. First, the census of Quirinius was not empire-wide, it was limited to Judea. Second, the purpose of a census is to figure out how many people are there in a particular area. So forcing people to move to a different area for the census defeats the purpose. They don't care where your ancestors lived, they want to know where you live so that they can tax you properly. And the way that the Israel um, land was structured during that time, being occupied and ruled over by Rome, there was a lot of complexities about who was ruling during when and who had what territory and which family member and all that kind of stuff. Well, guess what? Luke chapter 3, other places get those things exactly right in the book of Acts. Yeah, Luke chapter 3 got those things right, but Luke chapters 1 and 2 had to fudge the details in order to make quasi-historical events fit in with the birth narrative. So the first thing is, is when you look at the Bible, you see it's historically reliable because it gets the people, the places, the names, the historical situations right, which gives it the ring of credibility and the ring of truth. Remember that warning I gave you earlier about how apologists like to pretend that the Bible is one single source when it suits their purposes? Luke got some names right is not the same as the Bible as a whole is completely historically accurate. The second way you could trust that the Bible is historically reliable is that the text of the Bible, especially the text of the New Testament, has been very accurately transmitted from the first century to now accurately. And one of the ways we know this is because of the abundance of manuscripts we have. A manuscript was the early Greek writings when the New Testament was written in the, in the language of Greek. Those manuscripts are for, say, the book of Romans or the book of Matthew or the book of John, for example. Well, we have well over 5,500 Greek manuscripts alone, which is by far the most of any ancient document to work with. It's truly, as one scholar put it, an embarrassment of riches. Okay, but what's the time frame of those manuscripts? The vast majority were written over a thousand years after the events. 
What's more, because of the way medieval scriptoriums operated, a good chunk of those manuscripts are actually copies of other manuscripts that we still have today. Should it really be counted as a separate manuscript if it's just the medieval version of a photocopy? If we limit the time frame to, say, 300 years after the events of the New Testament, that leaves us with a paltry 124 manuscripts, the vast majority of which don't even contain a single complete book, with most just being tiny scraps and fragments, and all of them originating from Egypt. Meaning that if there was a very early competing manuscript tradition in a different region, we don't know about it, as all of the later manuscripts that we do have seem to share their origin in these Egyptian manuscripts. And given the church's tendency to eliminate materials that it considered heretical or unorthodox, I'm not prepared to just assume that the manuscripts from other regions would have been in agreement with the Egyptian ones, though I will freely admit that this amounts to not much more than speculation on my part. There's also a tendency in the manuscript tradition towards older manuscripts being copied by amateur copyists, who are more prone to making mistakes, or just straight up altering the text to fit their theological agendas. So if we take the fact that the older manuscripts tended to be less reliable, combined with the fact that the vast majority of the manuscripts we do have comes from the time when they started getting more reliable, Reliable, but also that they all trace back to a single manuscript tradition that originated in Egypt, then it is reasonable to approach the subject of accuracy with a certain amount of hesitation. Yes, it looks like we've gotten a mostly faithful reproduction of the New Testament that would have been compiled around 150 CE, but we can't be sure that that version of the New Testament was actually faithful to the original documents, and we can be fairly sure that the people who copied those documents made a bunch of mistakes before that version started circulating. So another way that you understand that the text has been reliably transmitted to us through the centuries is that it goes back to the beginning. You have early copies that go all the way back. So the time gap is about 35 to 50 years between the writing of the Gospel of John and the first manuscript fragment that was showing, showing up from John chapter 18, showing the time gap which limits the time in which corruption could occur. Okay, but you're fudging the data here in order to make your case look stronger than it is. Now, indeed, the oldest manuscript we have is from the Book of John. And if we take a late date for the Gospel of John and say that it was written in 120 CE and an early date for that manuscript, then it was indeed written within about 30 years of the P52 manuscript. But the P52 manuscript contained a grand total of 31 words, so that's less than 0.2% of the total word count of the Book of John. Can we really look at that tiny scrap and say that because those 31 words appear to have been mostly accurately transmitted through the manuscript tradition, that the whole book must also have been accurately transmitted? The first manuscripts where we actually start to see whole books showing up are P46 and P66, which are from about the 3rd century. And they only contain some of the Pauline epistles in P46, and most of the Gospel of John in P66. We don't get a single complete copy of the New Testament until the Codex Sinaiticus in the 4th century. That is plenty of time for corruption to occur. And so you have a ton of manuscripts to work with, and the time gap is very, very small. Well, the ton of manuscripts to work with are from more than a thousand years after the fact, so I wouldn't exactly call that a very small time gap. If we actually look at a small time gap, you end up with way fewer manuscripts. And that's it for this one, he just goes into summary mode after that. Today's comment of the day comes to you from everyone who is wishing me well in the comments of my last video. Thank you so much for your well wishes, and as you can probably hear in this video, I'm not quite back to 100% yet, but I am significantly better and I'm most likely done being contagious, so things are pretty much back to normal in my house. That is to say chaotic as fuck, but at least I can sort of function through the chaos. Thanks for watching! Don't forget to head to AIG.Vicerino.com to learn more about the science of geology from AIG, which I cannot stress enough how much I love the irony of that initialism. Thanks to Tim Robertson for being my Patreon and sponsorship manager, Mitch for being this week's PayPal hero, and special thanks as always to my patrons, Roy Leto, Stephen Myers, and all the rest, who are the road that is mostly just known to the Niagara locals that are my channel. If you'd like to be named Dickout, which actually is a real name, meaning that someone at some point in history was probably named Harry Dickout, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vicerhino, or by supporting the channel in one of the other methods that can be found at links.vicerhino.com, which is also where you'll find links to my other projects. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my P.O. Box address is in the description. See you next time!